Tracking the Beast, a Haunted Library production. The mission was to hunt the winter beast that was responsible for killing my father's livestock and his best friend Jake, his coon dog. Jake was a three-year-old blue tick coon hound that was found slaughtered and ripped in half three miles from my dad's property. Jake had been missing for about 48 hours when my father set off into the woods, determined to find him. My dad owns about 10 acres of property that's heavily wooded in the hills of West Virginia. Jake had been found underneath a tree before the year's first big snowfall. It had taken my dad about three hours of wandering around on his property before he finally stumbled upon his dog's carcass. Jake had been eaten alive it appeared. Most of his hair had been eaten or pulled from his body and even his bones were partly crushed and appeared to have bite marks on them. Simply put, there wasn't much left of his dog. Well, that's when my dad started to hear strange noises that he chalked up to be a wolf or maybe a mountain lion. So he hightailed it out of there. My dad doesn't get scared of anything. He's a tough backwoods hillbilly that doesn't let anything in the woods scare him. But he had later told me that when those noises began to occur right around the time that he had found Jake, it had sent chills through his body in a way he'd never experienced before. When he made it back to the house around midnight, he had called me, visibly shaken. I had agreed to come that weekend with my buddy Matt. Together, along with my dad, we would go out and search his property with our rifles to see if we could come across whatever stealthy predator was taking his livestock and what was most likely responsible for the death of his dog. My name is Ricky, by the way. I'm a 38-year-old farmer who has lived in Madison County, West Virginia, my whole life. There's always been reports of strange creatures in this state. I'm sure you've seen the TV show Mountain Monsters and things like that. But nothing has ever really been confirmed. All I know is, Jake was my dad's best friend. The slaughtering of the chickens was chalked up to coyotes. The killing of his cattle, however, begged the question for a larger predator. Most likely a male mountain lion. Well, either way, my dad was at his tipping point. Matt and I arrived at my dad's property on Saturday afternoon. The three of us had dinner and then packed some extra clothes. Four or five flashlights with some batteries and some miscellaneous items just in case we needed to start a fire and if we were out all night. It was basically going to be a scavenger hunt. We were hoping to maybe identify the culprit's whereabouts or where it might be seeking refuge. We knew it was a shot in the dark because these woods stretched way beyond my dad's property. The previous few nights had seen the weather dump nearly 4 inches of snow and the temperatures plummeted to 15 degrees. We all dressed in layers. I had two shirts on, a hoodie, and my Carhartt jacket. We set off with our stomachs full a little after 10 o'clock. My dad had insisted that we go after dark because he felt whatever the creature was, it was nocturnal. I didn't really think this was a good idea myself because it put us in danger, but I had reluctantly agreed. In the back of my head, I knew what was responsible. It was most likely a pack of wolves. The wind was fierce, and the snow fell steadily. It was beautiful, but also very scary out here in the black of the night. About three miles in, and an hour later was when I spotted the set of tracks in the snow. We stopped and shined our lights down on them. The snowfall was filling in the tracks pretty fast. Hey, check that out, I had said, bending down over the tracks. There's only three toes, guys. I looked up to Matt, and they're fucking huge, man. I examined the tracks a few more minutes in disbelief. Wolves had a pretty big paw, especially an adult male gray wolf who can weigh up to 170 pounds. But these prints were as big as any grizzly I'd ever seen perhaps much bigger. I'd say they were about 15 to 17 inches across. They could have been bigger than that, but that was just my estimate. You could still see the toenail on the prints, so they were pretty fresh, and they appeared to show the stride of a two-legged animal, not a four-legged animal. Bear? My dad had asked. I don't think so, I replied. These are too big to be a bear, and a bear has more than just toes, obviously. Plus, they seem to be bipedal. It's like a person who's been walking but they're not human tracks. 
I stood as a wave of uncertainty rushed through me. I had never seen anything like that. The tracks were leading into a patch of thick trees. Well, who wants to follow these? I finally asked. I do, answered my dad sternly. Whatever this is killed my dog, and it's costing me a fortune. I want to take care of it if we can. That's why we're out here. I looked up at Matt, though it was hard to make out his face in the dark. The flashlights only did so much. Let's carry on, I said, standing. I led the way. So we set off. After about three hours in, I began to wonder what exactly we were doing out here in the middle of the night, wandering around aimlessly in the backyard of a stealthy predator. Just when I was about to suggest we turn back, the track stopped at an old cabin that appeared to be abandoned. The cabin was about two miles off my dad's property. By this time, we had made quite the hike and we were growing tired. But thanks to how well we were bundled up, we were not yet cold. I followed the tracks up to the cabin's door and stopped. Hey, don't go in there, Ricky, Matt had said, walking up to me. You don't know what that is. Those tracks are huge, man. Whatever it is, it's inside that cabin. I looked back at the door that I had nearly opened. Snow fell on us as we stood and contemplated our next move. Whatever this animal was, it was seeking refuge, apparently, from the wind and snow inside the cabin. But common sense told me that wolves and mountain lions don't open cabin doors. And this thought chilled me. This 12 gauge will take care of it, my dad had growled. Well, if whatever that son of a bitch is gets a hold of us first, said Matt, it won't matter. And he had a point. That's when my dad yelled and raised his gun to the cabin window. Did you see that? Something was looking at us out the window. It has big ass yellow eyes. I backed up immediately, and so did Matt. The lone side window could only be seen from my dad's angle, since we were nearly at the door. He kept his gun on the window. Shit, those eyes were big, Ricky. Something's in there, man. His voice was panicked. It occurred to me that we had tracked something that was most likely unknown, and we had pinned it in. A lot of people would love to have been in our situation at that moment. People that like to track Bigfoot and unknown creatures. And I knew since it was trapped, it would make it all that much more dangerous. Then we heard it, the first sound. It was a sound though much louder than that, and it literally went right through you. Now Matt and I raised our rifles too. I had gone stiff from the low gutted but loud growl. What the fuck was that? Whispered Matt. I kept my gun aimed at the cabin. My dad lowered his and got his flashlight. He shined it on the cabin's window. The light's beam shone horrifying eyes that glared back at us behind the window. They were yellow and much larger than a human or any other animal that I could think of. My dad didn't speak, but Matt was freaking out. That's when we saw something from behind the cabin emerge. It stood there, growling. My eyes got wide as I stared at a creature I only thought was mythological. It was impossibly tall, standing on two legs, nearly as tall as the cabin roof, which was around eight foot. It was covered in black fur and had the snout of a dog or any werewolf you'd see in a movie. The eyes did seem to glow yellow. It had extremely long arms that hung down well past its waist. The canine-like snout held a mouthful of large, sharp, jagged teeth. And by the way, no movie could replicate this thing. It let out another howl, opening its mouth so wide that it could easily have fit two or three human heads in there. It weighed around four to five hundred pounds as it was heavily muscled and, like I said, impossibly tall. My dad tossed his flashlight down and raised his gun. This must have triggered the beast that I could only describe as a dog man. It made a run at us. In a flash, it was on Matt with speed that was indescribable. I bolted to the left and my dad jumped to the right, leaving Matt in the middle who froze. I tripped over some half-buried tree limbs and rolled a few times, face planting in the snow. That's when the cabin door exploded off its hinges and the other creature came walking out. 
I grabbed for my rifle as I saw the first creature pick Matt up like he was a rag doll. That's when I saw the full dog-like head with large, mangled, perked-up ears. The head was the size of a grizzly, if not larger, or maybe about four full-grown wolf heads. Matt screamed again in its grasp as he was hoisted up in the air, his legs and arms dangling and flopping in desperation. It all happened so fast. I watched in sheer terror as the beast ripped Matt's torso from his legs, severing his body into two pieces, the way a person would simply break a thick branch in two with their hands. Blood shot from Matt's upper stump as the creature threw both pieces of his body into the snow with force. The color red spattered the snow. Matt's legs twitched. His upper half violently convulsed as blood began to pour from his mouth. The dogman werewolf-like creature stood above his body, growling hideously, looking back at me and my dad. I got to my feet in a state of shock. I had my gun, but I couldn't even raise it. I was stunned, numb, and sickened. The second creature from the cabin let out a howl, piercing the night. That's when a gunshot startled me out of my shocked state. My dad had fired his gun in the air. He would later tell me that he was too scared to shoot the beast for fear of retaliation. The beast took off with amazing speed, but not before reaching down and snatching up Matt's upper body like it weighed less than a pound. The beast cradled it under its arms and made a dash into the woods faster than a coyote could run. The first creature followed, whizzing past us. And just like that, my dad and me were left with the eerie silence of the night and the lower region of what was left of Matt. On trembling, wobbly legs, my heart racing, I walked over to my dad who was also in shock. It was equivalent to a state of shock if you'd seen a ghost or maybe been involved in a serious car accident. What we had just saw was unbelievable, and to see Matt die like that was just unconceivable. That's when reality set in, and I began to feel faint and sick. I hunched over and emptied the contents of my stomach into the snow. My dad lifted me up when I was through. I ignored Matt's legs as they bled out, a red pool of blood seeping through the snow. We began the long trek back. I was sick the whole way. I stayed in shock. My friend had just been murdered, killed by something that was unexplainable, something that wasn't supposed to exist. It was the longest three hours of my life, but we finally made it back to the house. My dad has since sold his house and moved away from those mountains. Him and I have undergone scrutiny and suspicion for Matt's death, but we have passed lie detector tests and police do not consider us suspects. When police and dogs did go out there the next day, the rest of his body was gone. And I know the beast had to have come back to get the rest of him to eat him. Matt's remains have never been found to this day, and his death remains a mystery. I have tremendous guilt because I asked him to go on the hunt with me. As far as Matt's disappearance being a mystery though, or some unsolved case, it's not to my father and me. We saw what happened, and even though police don't believe us, we know that monsters do exist in the darkest, coldest of places.